Are you ready to be stirred and receive an impartation of faith to move forward into all that God has purposed for your life? Welcome to the Stirring of the Waters podcast. I am your host, Elaine Haynes. I will be sharing what the Lord has given me through the anointing of the Holy Spirit on the Logos and Rhema words of God. Welcome to Stirring of the Waters. I'm your host, Elaine Haynes, and today I'm going to be speaking on It's Time to Silence Unbelief. So I'm going to open in prayer. Father God, I just pray, Holy Spirit, move upon the hearers right now and on everyone that comes in the future to listen, Lord God, to the if faith rise up, let the words of the Lord, the words of the book, the words of your presence, Lord God, pierce their, penetrate their hearts, Lord God. Let eyes be open to see what it is you're doing and to hear what it is that you're saying. And I pray, Father, that you would anoint what I bring, Lord God, that it will bring impartation of faith, that it will bring a stirring to move forward, to lay the an ax to the root of everything that has stopped every person from moving forward in the things to which you have called them. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, this is episode 32. It's time to silence unbelief. Now, I've been hearing this for a little while, for actually for some months, the Lord's saying that. But right now, we're entering a new season. There's a new year on the Hebraic calendar, and there's opportunities to take new ground. Now, the truth is there's always opportunities to take new ground every day. But there are certain seasons when we are to advance greatly and there's battles that are raging in the spirit and the natural we all see it it's over our godly heritage and generational promises and it's imperative that we learn from the lessons of those that have gone before us paul speaks to that in first corinthians that it's these are examples i'm going to be getting into that in a minute so the truth is, okay, so we say, you know, I say it's time to silence unbelief. You know, we say that we're believers, we're full of faith, right? But our tongues sometimes tell a different story. We speak things that are faithless. We speak things that are, are not what God has said. We speak murmuring and complaining. Those are some of the masks of unbelief. Worrying, fearing, murmuring, complaining. And about eight years ago, the Lord really spoke to me regarding this. In fact, he's, I was shocked what he said and i'll tell you he reminds me of it more often than i'd like to admit because i still haven't mastered it so at the time i was complaining about a situation that i was in i was murmuring and complaining the lord said to me do you believe i'm sovereign and i said of course i do and then he said when i murmur and complain i'm complaining about the working of the holy spirit in my life orchestrating god's will to bring back god's plans many times through correction and redirection and the reality is when our situation doesn't look like we think it should, we sometimes assume it's the enemy or we begin to doubt God will move or is it even is moving. I think it's even harder to believe when it's a situation that doesn't look like we think it should that we're to believe he actually is moving right now. The fact is God is always moving. Sometimes he's moving in other people. Sometimes he's moving in, in the situations that he's bringing us into and, and us to get us ready for it. There's a lot of reasons, but God is always moving. We just don't always see it and we don't understand his ways. And oftentimes it's not even the big things. It's the little things we complain about rather than we have a choice. Talk about our blessings. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not his benefits, who heals my diseases. And that's just one thing, right? He, he sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies. His mercy and goodness chase us down every day. They follow us all the days of our lives. So a few weeks ago, I talked about the reality of living from a sound mind. And there are some key principles there. I encourage you, if you haven't heard us, to go back and listen to that one. But one of the scriptures that is so imperative is we have to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. One of the main things that Jesus rebuked his disciples for was their unbelief, their lack of faith. He would say things like, where is your faith? Did not I say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? O oh, faithless and perverse generation, etc., etc., etc. Look it up. 
do a Bible word search for faithless, unbelieving, doubt, worry, all those things. You'll see. He, st he spoke very strongly about it. John 6, 8, 20 and 29 gives us the um, incident where Jesus was asked, what do we do to do the works of God? And his answer was, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So do you believe in Jesus, not about him, about the history of him, but in him, in the reality that he's in you, in the reality that he is Lord of all, in the reality that, that he is bringing about the kingdom of God in the earth, even now through us, if we let him, if we believe. Do we believe in God's character, his sovereignty, his omnipresence, his omniscience, his omnipotent, omnipotence? Do we believe in these things? Do we believe in this reality, in this truth is what we need to believe in the truth? If we have doubts, we can take them to the Lord. Don't agree with them and speak them out of your mouth like they're truth. They're doubts. Recognize your weakness, but also recognize the truth, that God is not a man that he would lie, and that every word he has spoken shall not return void, but it will accomplish that which he has purposed it for. We can cry out to him. Ask Jesus to help you in your unbelief, as did the father of the boy possessed by an evil spirit that had tried to destroy the boy all his life. In Mark 9, 22 through 24, the man, first, the man told Jesus that the disciples couldn't cast out the demon. And then he said, and often to Jesus, he's saying this, often he has thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. And then he said, but if you, if you can do anything, if you, Jesus, can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said in response to that, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Then he cast out the demon. There is nothing impossible with God. God honored that mustard seed of faith. Now the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us the Israelites could not enter the promised land because of unbelief. Now we, in this age, do we have many promises that we've been given. And daily there are new lands the Lord wants us to take for the kingdom of God. A lot of times those new lands are, first we have to deal with the stuff in us. And Paul exhorts us to pay attention to their experience and the consequences of their actions so we don't fall in the same ways they did. So I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 3, 14 through 19, and then 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. These are the two scripture references I'm talking about now. So in Hebrews 3, 14 through 19, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence or our faith said fast to the end. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear? They would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. So he addresses hardened hearts. That's, that's a heart that doesn't trust God. Sometimes we've gone our own way. Sometimes we've been disappointed. So we harden our heart to any hope because we've been disappointed so many times. But a lot of times it's because we're only seeing what's in front of us in the natural. We forget what he has said. And when we only see what's in the natural and we're not looking with faith to the eyes to, the, to see what God is doing, our heart can become hard because of all the things. You know, the Bible tells us that the enemy in these last days, um, well, it says that, um, excuse me, I got that mixed up with a different verse. The Bible, it says that the love of many grow cold because of all that's happening in the world. We don't want that to happen. That means our heart's hard. If our love grows cold toward others, it means our heart's hard. And, you know, I'm going to, that's a whole other subject. I'm not going to go there. So 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock, that's capital R, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, 
and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. When we complain, we give the enemy access. I'm going back to the scripture. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition. They happened to them as our example. They happened to the other people in the Old Testament. But they happened, it's written in the New Testament for our example, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. What is that way of escape? Turning to him in every place of temptation, including doubt and unbelief. It's doubt and unbelief that's going to, then the next step is disobedience. If the enemy can get us to doubt, he can get us to disobey. So I'm going to focus on two things. When they tempted Christ by questioning, that was when they, they were questioning whether God was with them or not. That's, that's what it says was tempting that we were tempting Christ. When we question whether God is with us or not, we're tempting Christ. The second was their complaining, which caused them to be destroyed by the destroyer. Doubt and unbelief are synonymous when it comes to failing to inherit the promises and move forward into the fullness of all God has for us. Murmuring and complaining stems from unbelief that God is with us and that he's working in our midst to bring his word to fruition in our lives for his purposes to be established. Murmuring and complaining stem from unbelief. You know, sometimes it's a habit, a bad habit of, of mind and speaking. But here's the deal. You can have a bad habit of mind and you can change it. And stopping what you're, you don't have to speak it out. You can recognize what you're thinking and don't speak it. Speak truth instead. Yes, I see what's in front of me, but God can do all things. But God has said, I will never leave you forsake you. But God has said, I sent my word and healed you. Hebrews and 1 Corinthians, those two sections I read, are referring to the original group of Israelites who were delivered from Egypt. I think we all know that story, but I'm going to just bear with me. Joshua and Caleb were two of the 12 that went to spy out the promised land, but they were the only two that gave a good report. God had told the Israelites he was bringing them to a land of promise, flowing with milk and honey, with bounty of all kinds. And so all the twelve agreed, it's full of, just like God said, it's full of bounty. But there were also giants there. Now, in that first generation of Israelites in the, prom, in the wilderness, only Joshua and Caleb were able to go into the, next, into the promised land. They were the ones that were leading the next generation and the first generation died in the wilderness and joshua and caleb believed god was good and was keep his word and they were able to have faith when the circumstances looked contrary that's key to us they had the same circumstance as the ones who spoke unbelief the ones who spoke unbelief had a wrong perception of the same circumstance they were focusing on the giants and didn't believe they could overcome. They were looking at themselves and comparing themselves and their lack, so their ability without God, their lack, viewing themselves as grasshoppers compared to the giants. They allowed their thoughts to be controlled by fear, which brought down an unbelief regarding what God said. Joshua and Caleb recognized that God was bigger than those enemies and that because he had said it, because he was with them, that they would be able to overtake them. It's spelled out pretty plainly in Numbers 13.32. The ten unbelievers said, quote, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And Numbers 14.9 was Joshua's response. Quote, Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. 
Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. End quote. The enemy is to be our bread, the victory that gives us strength to move forward, our bread, our food. Every battle we overcome in faith makes us stronger. Every victory that we have becomes something we can remind ourselves of the next time another temptation comes along, the next battle that we have to face, and the enemy coming in trying to tempt us out of faith we can remind ourselves of all the other times that God has been for us, all the other times that God showed up. And if you, know, if you don't have anything else, you have the reality that he delivered you. He translated you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. And that is a miracle of which there is no comparison. When I look at my life, where I was, the fact that he met me, the fact that he delivered me, that he saved me, when I didn't deserve any of it, gives me confidence if he'll do that for me when and and there's so many things that came out of that he would do that for me when i didn't ask for it i didn't wasn't doing anything for him and he did that for me he's not going to stop living for me or working with me excuse me now when i'm living for him i remind myself of all the miracles all the healings all the deliverances all the provision time after time after time throughout my walk with him since 1981. So back to the story. So 40 years later, Joshua is leading the next generation. They were to take Jericho. God had directed them, circle the city seven times in seven days and then shout. That Joshua was going to ensure their victory. And how did he do that? An essential step was silencing unbelief. He remembered what happened before, why the first generation couldn't enter. And he implemented a divine strategy. As they were about to take Jericho, he directed the people not to speak a word for the full seven days that they were to circle the city. Joshua was determined that they were not going to fall in doubt and unbelief by speaking those things out, murmuring and complaining. So Joshua 6.10, And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither, give in, let, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth. Any word. Until the day I bid you shout, then you shall shout. Personally, I think that I picture myself in this. So I picture myself seven days. That's a long time to be walking around the city. Seven days, not saying a word. You know, when I'm silenced, like when I have laryngitis or something, right? Or when I'm in a, when I'm in a, in a sequestered place, not by my choosing, where God's dealing with me, he starts showing me stuff that's in my heart. I think that happened and they were able to give a shout. Because I think things started turning around inside when they started remembering that the Holy, the, the, the Spirit of God was dealing with them during that time. Anyway, that's just my thought about it because that's how he deals with me. So the Spirit-filled life Bible take, tells its, its note on Joshua 6.10, which is what I just read you. We cannot help what we see and hear, but our refusal to speak doubt and fear We'll keep our hearts more inclined to what God can do rather than what we cannot. And I think that's really important. So there are two factors that determine if we'll walk in faith or in doubt and unbelief. What we see in the circumstances, which is the facts as they exist in the moment, and the truth of what God says. So what will our heart choose to believe is the question. Will we believe God who has all power or will we see what's in front of us and measure it based on the strength that we have on our own. Hebrews 3 and 12 states the heart of unbelief is evil, departing from the living God. The living God. Departing from the living God. There are dead gods. They're the gods of this world that are always at work to tempt us out of faith. It's time to silence unbelief by refusing to believe those lying voices and speaking out what they say. They're dead to the spirit of the living God. They're lying voices from dead places. And the reality is, you are a new creature alive in Christ. The old man is dead and buried with him, and you are now born again, living for him. You're a new creature. Speak new words. God's words are spirit in their life. Lay hold of his words and let his words lay hold in you. When your flesh and soul are weak, heed God's words and silence unbelief. God told Joshua 
to meditate on his word day and night to have good success. He told them that at the very beginning of his journey. And Joshua took it to heart. Now, I looked up that word meditate, and it's not just thinking about it. It actually means muttering it. Speak louder than the voices of doubt and unbelief until your spirit man rises up over your flesh and soul. Silence that unbelief by speaking God's word until you believe it. Have the faith of Abraham. Romans chapter 4 tells us that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief from that weakness of his own body, but he was strong in his faith and gave God glory, being fully persuaded that God was able to do that which he promised. Abraham's mouth gave glory to God. He didn't waver and quake, speaking doubt and unbelief, but in his knowledge of God and his unsurpassing greatness, Abraham used his own mouth to glorify God, press into the reality of who the Lord is, his immeasurable love, his limitless power, his, his omniscience, his omnipresence, his omnipotence. Take authority over your flesh and soul and give glory to him until you are whole, body, soul, and spirit in perfect alignment to the truth of who he is and what he has said. Let Jesus truly be your head, directing your ways and even your mouth. And in that victory, you'll be able to shout. A really good depiction of this, in my opinion, I love this section, in Jeremiah 1, 9 through 12, Jeremiah is speaking, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set this day, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms, to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, and to build and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see the, a rod of an almond tree. This is life coming forth out of those dead things. This is spirit life rising up. The Lord said unto me, this is a new day, a new day, new birth, new day, new things coming forth. Then said the Lord unto me, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. What are you saying? Rise upon the pneuma wind of the Holy Spirit on the Word of God so that you see by the Spirit. Take authority over the flesh and soul and speak the Word of the Lord. There is no place for doubt and unbelief when we know God is for us. No weapon formed against us can prosper. The works that we're to walk in were ordained before time began, and what God has ordained cannot be stopped. I declare to you the quickening power of the Holy Spirit is bringing light to see the root of that fear that is holding you back from moving forward in faith to perceive and receive the overcoming power of the risen Christ to uproot that thing and move you into now faith for the new land before you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And in his name, I pray, amen. See you next week. Have, be blessed and go forward in faith. Thank you for listening to the Stirring of the Waters podcast. If you like what you heard today, visit ElaineHaines.com, that's A-L-A-N-E-H-A-Y-N-E-S.com, for books, blogs, and spiritual growth. You can follow me on Facebook and subscribe at CPNShows.com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. See you next week for the next episode.